So this week we get to look at another psalm of David. There are lots of those, but not all of them were written by David, but this we get two in a row. And if you take the two weeks together, last week we kind of saw David at his worst, right? We looked at Psalm 51, which was um, David wrote that after he committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband killed and he had done all of these awful things. But this week we get to see David being very faithful. So we kind of get to redeem this hero of faith today. <laughs> um, so if you have a Bible or can reach one, turn with me um, to Psalm 57. Psalm 57 is our text today. You heard bits and pieces of it in that song a second ago, but we'll read the whole thing. It says, Have mercy on me, my God, have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. I cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends forth his love and his faithfulness. I am in the midst of lions. I'm forced to dwell among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They spread their net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my path, but they have fallen in it themselves. My heart, O oh God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake, my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples, for great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for these words of praise from your servant David, and we ask that we could echo them and that you would teach us from them more about who you are and who we are as your people. In your name we pray. Amen. So if you were following along in your Bible or on your phones or whatever devices you have a Bible on, you may have noticed a little paragraph under where it says Psalm 57. It says that David wrote this psalm while he had fled from Saul into a cave. Kind of an interesting backstory. So I went back into the Old Testament and looked to see what exactly was going on. He's fleeing into a cave. And so here's, here's kind of the history of what was happening when David wrote this psalm. So Saul was the king of Israel. He was the first king that Israel had ever had, and he had his good moments and his bad moments like the rest of us, right? But it seemed like as he went on and spent more time being king, he kind of lost it. There, are, there were scholars that I read this week that constantly referred to him as that psychotic King Saul. <laughs> he just kind of, he lost it. He went a little bit crazy. Um, and so he was, he was misbehaving and not following God's commands and doing these kind of psychotic things. And God rejected him eventually as king. And after God rejected Saul as king, he led the people to anoint David as their next king. But the thing was, David couldn't take power until Saul died. So da Saul knew that David was anointed and he was insanely jealous. And then to make matters worse, to kind of take the knife and twist it into this psychotic King Saul, as they call him, the story of David and Goliath happened. Now, lots of you went to Sunday school. You, you know your Old Testament, so you know this story. But you'll remember the Israelites were fighting the Philistines. And the Philistines, their enemies, had this huge giant of a man named Goliath. I'm always curious, how big was he really? Because... If you look at, you know, old museums, everything's so short, so maybe he wasn't that tall. But, <laughs> but anyway, he was this huge giant of a man, and he was out there taunting the Israelites, begging someone to come and fight him, saying, none of the Israelites are brave enough to come fight me. And he was kind of right. None of them wanted to go fight this huge man, this huge powerful man, until David stepped up. And he was young, and he was small, and he was just a shepherd, but he said, I'll do it, because I know that God is on my side. And if you know how the story goes, you know that David took three small stones and had a little slingshot. I always kind of picture Bart Simpson there. but <laughs> And he, he took his slingshot and he threw the stones. And the Bible says that it hit Goliath right in between the eyes. 
And that defeated him. One little stone took this huge, taunting man down. And so David, you can imagine, was a hero. People loved David after this, and there was even a song that people would sing in the streets and around town that said, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. So they were automatically comparing, and of course, Saul was furious. He was already jealous of David for being anointed, and now his jealousy turned into rage, and he went on a rampage against David. He had this whole vendetta to kill David. And David got wind of this, and he fled into a cave. And that's when he wrote this psalm, when he was sitting in the cave. But the story doesn't end there. There was still more that happened to David while he was in the cave. So David, David ran, and he fled, and he made it to this cave and kind of sat in the back in the shadows. And Saul must have been not too far behind him because a day or so later, Saul came to that same cave. Now the Bible says, this is what it actually says, Saul came to relieve himself. It was a bathroom break, right, on this this killing rampage. So Saul was in in the front of the cave in kind of a vulnerable position, and David was hiding in the back. And he had a couple of friends with him helping him flee, and they said, look, David, here's your chance. You could sneak up on him, and you could kill him right now, and this could be the end of this whole thing. You would be king, and you wouldn't have to flee. You could do it. So David snuck up on Saul. What Saul was doing in all this time, we won't think about too much, but (laughs) David snuck up on Saul, but he couldn't bring himself to actually kill him. So what he did was he took his knife, and he cut off just a little corner of his robe, of his clothes that Saul was wearing, and went back into the shadows. And eventually it says that David then came out into the light and showed himself to Saul and said, hey, I'm here. I could have killed you just now, but I didn't. I spared your life. And as proof, he showed him this little piece of fabric that he had taken, this little corner of his robe. And scripture says Saul just broke down and wept. He couldn't believe after all of the violence and all of the fleeing and all of the, all of the plotting against David that David would show mercy like this, that he would spare his life. And Saul even apologized and said, you are a better man than me, essentially. And you would think that that would be the end of this battle, right? You would think that that would change things, but it didn't. If you keep reading in 1 Samuel where the story is from, There are still times where Saul is throwing spears at David and trying to kill him, and David spares Saul's life at least one more time before Saul eventually dies. Nothing was healed, but in this moment, imagine in all of this turmoil and running, this is when David writes a worship song. Sometime in this cave, he stopped and he sat down and he wrote Psalm 57. Now, last week, when we heard Psalm 51, right, like we already mentioned that he had done some awful things, he had, he had committed adultery and murder, and he was begging God for forgiveness in Psalm 51. And if you put those two together, they kind of make sense. But Psalm 57, when you think of this story, has a few surprises for us. You'd expect, given David's situation, you'd expect it to be a psalm of fear, or just begging God for safety. And there are moments of that. You know, the psalm starts off, Have mercy on me, my God, have mercy on me, and you I take refuge. I'm in the midst of lions. I'm forced to dwell among ravenous beasts. There are moments where where David asks for for God's safety and his protection, but there are many more moments in the psalm where David just offers his heartfelt worship to God where he says, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. God sends forth his love and his faithfulness. My heart, O God, is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake my soul. Somehow, right smack in the middle of all of this violence and terror, David stops and finds time to worship God. 
And this isn't just kind of feeble, forced worship. This is worship that awakens. This is worship that awakens souls and instruments and even the very dawn, the light itself is awakened by this worship. It seems like David is almost empowered by the danger that he's faced with. It's almost like he's spurred on to worship instead of cowering in fear like I know I would have been. Really, this psalm, Psalm 57, is David at his best. This is the David that earned the title of hero of the faith. This is the David who could see beyond his own fear into God's glory. He could see beyond the fleeting refuge of the cave that he was hiding in to his eternal refuge, his eternal safety in the goodness of God. David's able to look up from his own urgent matters to something even more urgent and more important to his heart, and that is that God be glorified even in the most difficult situations, maybe especially in the difficult situations. He could have been angry with God for allowing this to happen. He could have blamed God. He could have become depressed and kind of closed in on himself. Or he could have been apathetic and decided, God doesn't love me. Why should I even try? But he didn't. He didn't do any of those things. Instead, he deliberately chose to worship. And I think it was a choice. David says, my heart is steadfast, awake my soul, as if he's summoning up the willpower and the strength to worship. It's not that David is oblivious to what's happening. He clearly feels it and recognizes it. It's not that he's ignoring what's happening. No, he's choosing to worship right in the middle of great, great difficulty. So I have to admit, I I read this story and this psalm over and over this week, kind of struggling to figure out what does this have to do with us? I don't know about you, but I've never had the leader of my nation trying to kill me and I had to hide in a cave. I can't, you know, I can't stand up here and tell you a story of what I did in that situation. (laughs) Thankfully, that's never happened. But then this this week as I was preparing, I came across a great quote um, from a songwriter named Krista Black Gifford who, um, she writes worship songs and songs that are on the radio. Um, But she spoke at a conference recently and said this. She said, if you're not anchored in the goodness of God, you will lower your theology to match your pain. If you're not anchored in the goodness of God, you will lower your theology, your beliefs, your faith to the level of your own pain. And when I read that, I thought, wow, David's faith must have been so strong. His knowledge of God must have been so sure to be able, in this moment, hiding for his life in a cave, to worship. His faith must have been so strong, and we can see that strength as he says, Be exalted, O God, among the heavens, as he sits in the shadows of a cave. He saw God in all of his glory, not just his own pain. He recognized God's goodness, and he deliberately chose to worship. (laughs) Now, I may never have been stuck in a cave running from the leader of my country, but I have had moments where the last thing I wanted to do was worship, and there are often things that are kind of embarrassingly small, in comparison to what David was going through. I remember when I was in the first trimester of pregnancy, you may have heard I'm having a baby, and I was nauseous. <laughs> I remember feeling nauseous, and the last thing I wanted to do was tell people about God's glory. I wanted to tell them how miserable I felt, and then I wanted to go take a nap and not do anything else. But <laughs> often these little small moments of pain or insignificance are enough to derail me and to make me want to ignore my faith and focus on me for a while. Sometimes it's easy to get so sidetracked that even when we're in the smallest bit of pain, it's so hard to worship. And that's not even to mention the big things that happen when we deal with disease or divorce or addiction 
or when we turn on the news and hear about bombs in Gaza that killed children on the beach, or planes that were shot down by missiles in war zones. It's so easy for us to let our faith sink to the level of our pain. So David's example this morning is a strong one. In the middle of pain and fear that I can't even begin to imagine, he chose worship. He chose to focus above himself on God's glory instead of within himself in his own pain. I hope that each one of us, myself included, can make that same choice when it's our turn to choose. You probably remember in 2012 the shootings that took place at um, Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. It was a terrible tragedy and it was, I know it really rattled me, especially because it was in the beginning of a preschool year and I thought of what would happen if that happened downstairs in our preschool. But one of my favorite writers, Anne Lamott, wrote a great piece, a beautiful piece responding to it, um, asking the question, how, how do we see God in these difficult times? So what she wrote was a little bit in her book, Some Assembly Required, and it's a conversation that she had with her and her friend Tom, who's a Jesuit priest. And I'll read a little bit of it to you now. Um, she wrote, where, I asked Tom, in such despair and chaos, is Advent, is God's coming into our lives. And Tom said, faith is a decision. Do we believe we are ultimately doomed, that there's no way out, or that God and goodness make a difference? There is heaven and community and hope, and hope that there is life beyond the grave. And I replied, Anne says, but Tom, at the same time, the grave is very real and dark and cold and lonely. And Tom said, God's coming is not for the naive, because in spite of the dark and the cold, we can see the light. In spite of the dark and the cold, we who know Christ can see the light in the midst. Faith is a decision and one that we can't let sink to the level of our own pain. Instead, today, no matter what's happening in you or around you or to you, choose worship like David did. Intentionally, deliberately choose to remember God's goodness, to be rooted in God's goodness, God's light, that there is hope and community and life beyond the grave, even if that feels so dark and cold. After all, in 1 John verse 5, it says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never overcome it. That light, that hope that we have is Christ. It's, that light is our salvation, our redemption through Christ. Christ. And when we remember that, we can say, along with David, in all times, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Joshua 24, verse 15, calls us to the same choice, saying, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors or the gods of your enemies whose land you are living in. But as for me... In my household, we will choose the Lord. In our lives, we're faced with so much darkness, and it can feel so cold and so lonely. But we know that there is a light with a capital L, that we find hope in Christ, and that we can be called today to choose worship. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for this calling, even if it is a difficult one sometimes. We thank you that you give us light and hope, even if everything around us tells us to be afraid. Lord, let us follow David's example this week, this month, this year, throughout our lives, and choose worship, choose to focus on your goodness, even in the midst of difficulty. In your name we pray, amen.